Fancy adventurers, greetings. I'm Todd Lyons, and uh, this time we're picking up where we left off, trying to get the rest of the way through Volume 1 of Encyclopedia Magica. And uh, if you haven't seen the first part of the video, it's probably best to stop now and turn back and uh, watch that first. Mind you, other than the preamble <laughs> where I give some of my thoughts on uh, what kind of book this is, yeah, maybe you're not missing anything. Basically, I just intend to go through and hit uh, more highlights. And uh, that's a very personal thing. What What's interesting to you in this book and uh, what I'll stop and read are probably two different things. But uh, I don't know. Maybe in the course of skimming through, you'll see things that, uh, that are of interest to you. And uh, I have seen this book around. Archive.org is one of the places. But... Uh, there are probably plenty of options around as far as how to get a copy for yourself. Anyway, proceeding. Zygag Spell Component Pouch. Gee. <laughs> From Unearthed Arcana, of course, naturally. That's Gygax backwards, so that's a... It's a Gary reference. This item is a normal belt pouch of an unremarkable sword, although it radiates faint magic if detect magic is used, and any... Wizard possessing the sort of pouch can simply think of the material components needed for a certain spell, and they appear in the pouch. Well, that's awfully convenient. Components is one of those things that, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's never really been enforced in any game that I've been in. And I do know that uh, in order to manage the power of, of the, the magic user, that uh, expensive spell components and detrimental effects are just some mechanisms that were added to the game to make them uh, to make it less appealing, I guess, to use magic. And uh, I love this thing because uh, I used to play a magic user. I haven't since I returned to the hobby, but uh, when I started playing in the late 70s, I was sort of foisted into the role of magic user because uh, the dungeon master that uh, that I was playing with, he wanted to play a character in the game also, and he wanted to yeah, he wanted to have the cool fighting type characters, so I think he started as a ranger and then he became a paladin. But uh, as we grew together as characters, it became clear that uh, I was going to be a much more powerful character than he was. So in the end, I didn't mind too much. But I really didn't like the whole spell component, the, the VSM, uh, verbal somatic material. We ignored the M's. Really, yeah, whatever. Anyway, proceeding. Ball. Ball of bowling? Are you kidding me? Okay. Ball of bowling is a plus three weapon that can knock over any opponent weighing 500 pounds or less that it hits on a natural roll of 19. Up to two other similar opponents behind the one struck are also bowled over. On a natural 20, up to four similar opponents are similarly affected if the jock yells out the magic word strike when releasing the ball. So I've heard some criticism. It was mostly for the fourth volume that uh, that there were some silly things in this uh, in this book or in the series, and I have to say that uh, I'm not one of the people that's put off by a bit of silliness. I I like, <laughs> and I guess you shouldn't be surprised when you look at the source, Dragon Magazine, and uh, that is one of the things that I like. At, at a glance, you can tell where the source was for each particular item that's included in this four volume set. So. Uh, when you have people uh, doing a one-off in Dragon Magazine, yeah, it may not be the, the sort of quality that necessarily the high hurdle would be required for, for getting an item into uh, to a print book. Anyway, this is one way to sneak that in through the back door. Banner of Friendship. When seen by any creature of less than five hit dice, this banner says, Welcome. All monsters and NPCs affected have a 66% chance of wanting to visit and, if not attacked, may be friendly to whatever they meet. Plus two bonus to reaction rolls. Okay. Barrel? Barrel of monkeys. You know, when, when Barrel came up, I was thinking to myself, monkeys, but then I thought, maybe it won't be there. I kind of hope it won't be there. Let's read it, shall we? When this barrel is examined, a victim looking inside of it must make a spell, uh, sorry, must make a saving throw versus spell or be polymorphed 
into a white ape. In addition, regardless of the results of the saving throw, one white ape appears within the barrel and leaps out, attacking anyone nearby. Another white ape appears each turn thereafter until 100 of the creatures have been created or until a remove curse spell is applied. The barrel loses all of its magical powers if moved by hand, but may be transported by the use of telekinesis. Okay, so that's not exactly the children's play thing that, that uh, the title would suggest, but maybe the never-ending barrel of salt pork. Yeah, well, not not great for uh, for my uh, Muslim and, and, and Jewish friends, but... Uh, <laughs> I guess you can play whatever you want in a game like this. Basket of Devouring. Okay, I uh, don't even want to read that. Bead. Beady eye. Okay, upon command, this bead becomes a small eye, and the user may see with the eye as long as it remains within 60 feet. If it's rolled, the user must make a saving throw versus spell or become dizzy, confused, and then completely stunned until the bead is destroyed. If crushed while in use... By someone being spied on, for example, the user must make a saving throw versus spell or be blinded. Curable by the usual methods. Although the user may have any number of extra eyes with these beads, the eyes cannot be closed and the user cannot avoid looking through them, I guess while they're in operation. Any monster with a gaze attack that looks at the eye in use, the user must make an appropriate saving throw. Possibly each round and may not look away. Okay. But upon command, it turns back into a bead again. Okay, that could be useless or useful or or potentially dangerous. You have to really know what it is you intend to see before you go rolling out one of those things. Pardon me, won't you? I have to feed the dog. Okay, so it's not a different day, but this is a different shirt. So just to give you a sense of how challenging it is for me to record a video, I'm going to change shirts every time I have to pause. Yeah, due to family responsibilities or pet ownership responsibilities or really anything <laughs> beans beans really there's a there's a beans category bean of ooh slime and jelly i can only imagine when these beans are thrown against a solid surface they change into one of the uh, amorphous life forms often found in dungeons yeah you better hope that you don't try to eat any of these beans i wonder if that's been anticipated as part of the uh, description a green bean transforms into a green slime, yellow into a gelatinous cube, white into crystal ooze, gray into gray ooze, and orange into an ochre jelly, which yeah, doesn't sound very tasty. The beans are generally carried in metal containers, and a character who falls with beans in his or her pocket risks activating it. A dexterity check is applicable. If a container holding a bean misses a saving throw versus a crushing blow or falling, the bean activates. <laughs> here we go, here we go. PCs who eat beans discover that these beans taste horrible. If a PC spits it out before swallowing, there's no ill effect. But if it's swallowed, he or she must roll a saving throw versus poison for each bean swallowed with a successful saving throw indicating the following effects. An ingested ooze, slime, and jelly bean causes the character to suffer flu-like symptoms for 2d4 days as the bean activates, resulting in... Oh no! Oh no! As the bean activates, the resulting life form dies, and the body attempts to purge it. Okay. I can only imagine puking up an ochre jelly. Symptoms include extreme nausea and vomiting, distended stomach, diarrhea, and body aches. Such a character could be transported in a wagon, but would not be strong enough to ride a horse. Yeah, I'll bet. Effects are cumulative with each bean swallowed. The character suffers minus four penalty to all attack rolls, and strength and constitution scores are reduced by three points for the duration of the illness. So yeah, yeah. if any attribute drops to zero, the character dies. So yeah. Best case scenario, you get sick. Worst case scenario, you die. Fun. Okay, so we have bellows, we have belts, bench, berries, a blanket, blanket of comfort. Are you kidding me? I own a blanket of comfort. This blanket automatically maintains a comfortable a temperature for anyone sleeping under it. It cannot maintain a temperature difference of more than 30 degrees, however, from the ambient atmosphere. Okay, so maybe this is slightly more special than the one that I have. Oh gosh, Blasphor's Magical Diapers and Crib of Pushing. We're going to have to read this. 
Blasphor was a kindly and studious wizard who lived with his wife, Atrina, in the tiny village of Spignon, a poor farming community many miles from the nearest trade route. Blasphor eventually left Spignon for a wilderness retreat where he could do his research without interruptions. Atrina, pregnant with their first child, was less than eager to go, but Blasphor convinced her that he needed her help. Besides, he argued, there could be no better way for their child to come into the world than surrounded by the magnificent splendor of nature. So reluctantly, Atrina agreed. Six months later, in a small cabin deep in the beautiful remote woodland... Wow, sounds like a travel brochure. Atrina gave birth to triplets. Sadly, she died in childbirth, leaving Blasphor alone with his three new sons. I want Fred McMurray to play the part of Blasphor. But Blasphor chose to return to the village and continue his research while raising his sons as best he could. However, his research went very slowly, I understand that, and caring for three infants proved all but overwhelming Able to transmute only the simplest of gases and minerals, he developed diapers as an experimental novelty that kept his babies dry and clean. A great help to an overburdened father, but hardly the breakthrough that he desired. <sighs> All right. Believing himself a failure, Blasphor was surprised when new parents in the village took interest in his magical diapers. Intrigued, he began to tinker with another of his seemingly minor magical experiments, and soon came up with a baby cradle that completely provided for an infant's needs. The cradles were made available at harvest time, much to the delight of the overworked parents. The diaper resembles an ordinary white diaper, but the cloth is somewhat softer and silkier and sparkles slightly in the sunlight. Wow, so much love and care into crafting this description. Small leather straps in the corner serve as fasteners. The cradle... Meanwhile, is a rectangular box made of polished wood, typically oak or maple. Colorful caricatures of animals and babies are painted on the sides, and two wooden rockers are attached to the bottom. Oh, dear. I don't know whether I feel intrigued by this as a, as a labor-saving device, or if uh, I feel disgusted that he has created these devices... Uh, like a self-rocking cradle, and uh, anyway, I'm just gonna let that sit in the back of my brain. Uh, I haven't come to a to a, a a judgment on that yet. So, blowgun, boat, bone, book. Well, yeah, bonnet, bonnet, and book. I expected to find a lot of books in here. Well, that's cute. <laughs> There's a familiar piece of artwork. That's, based, that's the cover to the first uh, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Unearthed Arcana book. Boot. Boot of comfort. <laughs> I'm just going to want to read everything that, that's of comfort because... All right. The boots of comfort fit the feet of any humanoid of any size. They feel like house slippers, which they are, but are as durable as hard leather. So, hmm. There's really nothing interesting about that. Seems like filler. Boots of jogging. Also referred to as sneakers. No. Skip. <gasps> wait, wait, wait. Mongasons of free movement. This, uh, this speaks to me. These beaded leather shoes are marvelous talismans that convey multiple effects. They function as boots of elven kind that allow their wearer to move silently. They also permit full movement rate, whatever the footing, as long as the character is walking. Thus, he or she can cross swamps, wade through shallow water, but not swim, even cross a pool of stickly tar, as if walking on smooth, leveled ground. Okay. What I want to know is, do you have mucklucks for winter? Okay. There's a lot of barking going on. I'm not sure if you can hear, so one moment. I'm back. Can you imagine the number of shirt changes I would have to do, like, if I would have tried to do this ten years ago? <laughs> I can't. All right. And, uh, I don't think I'm done. Bottle of booze. Bottle of booze. Yeah, not that kind of a bottle of booze. Literally. When opened, this item admits a chorus of loud snarls, hisses, and booing sounds for one round then ceases. All within 60 feet must run from the stage in terror 
and embarrassment. No, must make a morale check if applicable. Those not affected by morale suffer minus two penalty to attack and damage rolls for six turns with no saving throw. After three openings, the bottle disappears. Yeah. Am I disappointed? Yeah, that, that would be another non-magical item if it was the type of bottle of booze that I was imagining. Um, hmm. Bottle of graffiti. Are you kidding me? This ornate brass bottle has a lead stopper covering covered with special seals and sigils that are better left untranslated. Hmm. What is that talking about? Yeah, salty language. If the stopper is removed, four air elementals armed with spray cans pop out and paint rude slogans and obscenities all over everything and everyone in the area. They cannot be ordered back into the bottle or restrained in any way, except by a sensor controlling air elementals. See also. Okay. Indeed. Bow. Yeah. Is there an interesting bow? Doesn't seem like it. Bowl of blood. Blech. Boxes. Girls, girls, tackle box, and portable canoe. Goal retired from the adventuring life many years back. He was a friend of mine. Among the treasures that he accrued and kept for his twilight years is his own special tackle box and portable canoe. Not only... Does this six by six by one inch packet store a complete set of fishing poles and a tackle box filled with lures and other fishing accessories? But it unfolds into a canoe and paddles for two. Coral, did you have that special someone to retire with? It doesn't say here, but it uh, it does store live bait for up to three months. Absolutely. Money changer. Well, that's uh, that could be useful. I know. Be right back. Bracelet of charms. I'm not even going to read that. Maybe it's interesting. Maybe I'll be sorry and I wish for the time back. Bracelet of hog tying. Okay. You, you got me. A character who puts these bracelets on screams in agony, buckles at the waist, and falls to the floor. Delicate gold chains fly up and connect the bracelets together, wrapping themselves around the anklets as well, effectively hog-tying the prey. Hmm. <laughs> okay. Moving on. Bracers. Bracers of cleanliness. Now, this was something I noticed in the previous... Uh, video. Just the number of items that had to do something with cleanliness. And uh, I'm a person that appreciates cleanliness. I had a work experience that forever changed my, uh, my appreciation of cleanliness. Anyway, I would be curious though, just the number of times that I've accidentally bumped into cleanliness, how many items in this entire four volume set sort of border on cleanliness? And I suppose one way would be to just, uh, do a word search, but I'm sure there's probably some things here that don't necessarily use the word clean, but you know that's what they mean. Anyway, I spent so much time uh, framing that subject, there's no time to actually discuss what the braces of cleanliness were all about. Uh, bridal, okay, brooch, room, okay, brush, okay. Brush of grooming? <laughs> this is a rune-colored, sorry, rune-covered brush of dragon bone and animal bristles. Upon uttering the command word, which is written in elvish runes, the brush begins to groom the hair of the holder. Okay, clearly. That, uh, well, I don't know. In game, I suppose I could uh, have a full lush uh, lump of, of, of hair or, or really whatever I'd imagined and desired. But, uh, yeah. Real-life me would be, yeah, <laughs> no use whatsoever. Buckle. Whoosh. Buttercup. Buttercup's bouquet. Okay. 
All right, I'm going to skip that button. Button cabinet. Cadaver comb. Cameo. Really? Like the little can. Okay. Can of worms. Oh. Is every turn of phrase or bad pun that exists, has it been created as a magic item in the set somewhere? Given that this set of books contains entire single books, and like the Book of Marvelous Magic, which is what the can of worms is from, it seems very likely that uh, every dad joke, every adaptation of a phrase is probably in here somewhere. The can of worms appears to be a can of moonlight, but when it's opened, one... <laughs> okay, all right. So it's, it's almost like the you spring off the top there and the, and the snakes pop out, that sort of a, of a... Yeah, except these are real gray worms and they attack everyone inside. Okay. Candles. All right. Candles of blinking. Don't they normally do that? Of course, it means the spell blinking. And upon lighting it, the user begins to blink and continues to do so until the candle is extinguished or if the user blinks outside of the area of effect. Okay. Candles of convocation. <laughs> Those were at my daughter's graduation. Um, these large candles can be found in all sorts of garish colors. When one is lit, the lighter and the entire party find themselves instantly teleported to a high school pep rally in an alternate plane of existence where they remain stranded until the candle burns out or until they lead their section to victory in the cheering competition. Okay. How much do you hate your players? Or maybe you have a real quirky bunch of people that would appreciate being transported to a high school pep rally. Oh dear. There's the candle of smoke detection, which detects itself. This object made of an unknown substance is formed in the shape of an ebony candle with a flame atop, the hole being about four inches high. Whenever an excessive amount of smoke is present, even just from cooking, it emits a wailing... <laughs> okay. Uh, a beep. This cannot be used in rooms heated by poorly made fires. Okay. And ostensibly, supposedly, I'm sure it does not... It's not set off by itself. Oh, that would be... Stupid and pointless. Candle snuffer. I have a candle snuffer. I thought I was a classy dude for purchasing uh, big, expensive candles on, on wrought iron stands, and of course I had to have the candle snuffer there. But never, never, never did I ever consider the candle snuffer of death. And when this snuffer puts out a candle's flame, each living creature within 60 feet must make a saving throw versus death magic or die on the spot. That is, snuffed out. There's some serious dad joke stuff in this series of books. Okay. Cane. Cane of age? Hmm. See, all sorts of bad jokes and adaptations of, of common sayings. And we have not even got to the apparently really bad fourth volume. And, and maybe we won't. Um, based on the uh, uptake so far, people only make it about seven minutes through my first video here, so there's, I'm anticipating zero demand to, uh, to get through this entire series. Okay, canister of condiments, featuring the ketchup of lowness, mustard of success, pepper of sneezing, salt of the earth, and jelly of attraction. Ooh, and don't forget the jam of logs. Let's take a close look at the mustard of success. This hardened yellow goop has no effect unless an edged weapon is used to cut it, any weapon thus treated gains a plus two bonus to all attack rolls for one hour. So, take that big oversized knife of yours that you fight with, slather it with some mustard, and gain that plus two bonus. Indeed. The Canteen of Coolness. It holds one quart of liquid and keeps it at 40 degrees Fahrenheit. What is that in Celsius? I'm not going to take the time to look it up, regardless of its surroundings. It's said to work especially well with certain red wines. Sure. Is there a cap of coolness? First school cap. At first, this school cap appears to be even better than others. The wearer gains a plus four 
to all saving throws against magic spells of one particular school of magic. People that get into the hobby still working through their demons from high school. What is happening? School cap. Okay, look, there it is. We looked at the cursed school cap, and let's look now at the school cap. The wearer of this cap gains a plus two to saving throws against spells of one particular school of magic. Okay, it's kind of the same thing, except this one is cursed. What is the cursed effect here? So in the cursed version, the wearer suffers a minus four penalty to saving throws against spells of all other schools, and the cap cannot be removed until a remove cursed spell is cast. Okay. Cap of sleep. Cape of good hope? Are you kidding me? This item gives the wear a morale of 10, if applicable, and a bonus of plus four on all saving throws versus fear. It also allows a saving throw to be made without adjustments whenever magically created fear is so powerful as to allow none normally. Okay. Hmm. I'm going to get us through this book. I swear I'm getting us through this book. Carpet. The rug of welcome. <laughs> the rug of self-cleaning. Okay, we're doing that. It's an ordinary rug. When a command word is spoken, the rug rises up and shakes itself free of dust and dirt. However, it does not take itself outside. For that, you probably need to get the dustpan of shoveling. That's not there. Now I'm scared. Should we do a word search in the book for a dustpan of shoveling? The rug may be of any form, from a small throw rug to a large carpet. Okay. Cases of compression, document transmission, and, of course, Tensor's Portmanteau of Frugality. Let's read that. That is just queerly named enough that it, uh, it speaked my interest. This moderately large black leather traveling case contains a bewildering number of small instruments, tweezers, measuring beakers, small ceramic jars, and the like. It can be used to extract the greatest possible benefit from certain single-use magic items, by partly diluting or mixing them. All potions, oils, dusts, incenses, glues, solvents, and Nolzer's marvelous pigments can be affected by Tensor's portmanteau of frugality. So, you can use this to squeeze out more uses for your magic items. Yes, like people that add water to the juice. Do you really want to be that sort of person? This is the item for you. Uh, cask? Okay. Cloud Castle. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. And Cloud Castle, too. Catapults. Cauldrons. Sensor of Conduct. This item appears to be a sensor of controlling air elementals. However, instead of producing the expected result, it emits an invisible gas that has an odd effect on all within 60 feet. Those affected become unable to explain any detailed action in combat. The victims cannot aim at specific at a specific portion of a target, such as a tentacle. When any victim reaches zero hit points, it quietly sits down and expires without bleeding, moaning, or performing any sort of normal dying activity. Never thought to describe it as a dying activity. The effect is identical to that produced by game violence. See stringed instruments. Oh, I will. Chains. Chair? Chair of amnesia. I must have several of those in my house here because I swear to God, sometimes I enter a room, I sit down, and I can't remember why I came in the room. So thank you, Dragon Magazine 73. Please pick them up, get them out of my house. The only way to fix that is to get up, get out of the chair, leave the room to the place that I had the thought, and then re-enter and, and try to hold on to that memory, what, what it was that brought me in the room in the first place. Yeah. Apparently the uh, unconscious, silent, pitying cries of the chair of uh, forgetfulness, beckoning me forth to sit down and forget what it was that I was supposed to be trying to do. Of ugliness? <laughs> Haven't most men owned the chair of ugliness? <laughs> You have to sell it. Your wife or your girlfriend refuses to have it in the house. They find it embarrassing. So to impress you, it, it gets sent to 
the Salvation Army or a Goodwill, what have you. This item appears and functions as an armchair of seeing in all respects, but when someone sits, it lowers its victim's charisma immediately to three. That is a real-life thing. I am much less sexy to my wife if I'm sitting in an armchair of ugliness. Charisma returns to normal 24 hours later or if a removed curse is applied. However, the victim must also make a saving throw versus spell with a minus four penalty to the roll or be struck, stuck fast in the armchair. <laughs> so it pulls you in. Will not let you go. The chair and victim may be carried about, but any attacks on a seated victim, obviously, gain a plus four bonus to attack rolls. And the victim's dexterity adjustment to armor class, if any, does not apply. Yeah, pretty obvious there. Chalices. The Holy Grail and Holy Grail 2. Okay. I don't even want to know. I'm, uh, oh God. So I see Chariot, and the first thing to pop in my head is Chariots of Fire, which was a movie in 1982, I want to say. It's, it's back there. And of course, right under Chariot is the Chariot of Flames, which is also known as the Chariot of Fire or Sustar's Chariot. So it's merely the spell, 7th level spell, that's fashioned into a permanent magical device, often with additional powers. Okay, so. The Chariot of Flames at first appears to be an unremarkable two-wheeled chariot with a yoke designed for two horses, but when a command word is spoken by a person who has mounted the chariot, it bursts into flames and two fiery horses appear before the harness. Beings other than the chariot's driver and passengers who come within five feet of the chariot suffer 2d4 points of damage. <laughs> per round. Okay. Lovely. Charms. Okay. I'm just thinking. Oh, there was a bracelet of charm earlier. Okay. But now there's charms. Charms of distraction, a favor of hunting. Charms of pest protection. When this intricately carved miniature mahogany bed in a bag of woven string or netting is placed underneath the bed, it drives away all bed bugs and mosquitoes. <laughs> well... If you're one of those really cheap people who uh, stays at the most inexpensive dives in all those little towns that you pass through on your, on your way on your adventures, then this could be lovely, for sure. A rabbit's foot. Okay. Found everywhere. Not very, very interesting. Cheese. Cheese of odors. Cheese is a magic item. Really? So should I read? No. I've answered my own question. It's the cheese of vile odors, is what we will read. This item appears and functions as a cheese of odors, but the smell produced may be, as in 50% chance of cutting the cheese. Remarkably bad. So vile, in fact, that within 60 feet... All suffer a minus two penalty to charisma and morale, and a minus one penalty to attack rolls and saving throws for one turn. No saving throw. <laughs> cheese of vile odors. Chess, all right. Chest, chest of drawers. I have one of those, the non-magical variety. It doesn't beckon me to read it. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pushing through. Chilling snare, circlets, lots of circlets. Claw, cleats of gripping. Okay. Again. Is this a magic item? We're just taking something that exists and we're... Well, swords exist, right? Okay. I'm sorry, I'm going to turn the grump off now. Aware of these useful items can walk on other impassably slippery surfaces, even if magical. Sheer surfaces cannot be climbed, but any slope, 45 degrees or less, can be easily scaled. Ah, when used in combination with the claws of raking, the wearer may climb sheer surfaces as well. As a fourth-level thief, the cleats make clicking noises when worn, so forget about trying to surprise others. Yep. Cloaks. We're on to cloaks. The cloak of many colors? Okay. This rare garment can so shift its pigmentation that the wearer is immune to effects of color spray, prismatic spray, and the like, and can pass through a prismatic sphere or a wall, together with all items carried or worn within the cloak, as though the barrier did not exist. Only aware, not their companions, are so protected. Cloak of warmth. <laughs> yeah. So I've written a uh, an adventure for the basic fantasy role playing game, where there are some non magic items in it that I have given uh, magical sounding names to, just because I thought it was funny, 
And uh, I had no idea that, uh, meanwhile, there's this book that, that it's doing the same thing, except it's, it's sort of marginally giving some powers to some of these magic items. In any case, yeah. I'm not going to mention what the title of it is. I'll probably bore you to tears by mentioning it repeatedly the way that I do my book whenever it sees the light of day. Speaking of which, yeah, I really hope these get to print. I know that it's, yeah, it's it's a volunteer effort and uh, things are printed when they're printed. But uh, after a year, you start to get a little sad thinking, will my book ever see the light of day? Um, to a wide audience. Lots of people have downloaded it. Cloak, clasp of holding, cloth, cloth of polishing, to make clean the, the clean family silver easier, Orlo created a magical cloth of polishing for Fran. Yeah, nothing uh, sells the authenticity of a description than mentioning actual names. This one foot square cloth, when rubbed lightly over any metal surface, removes all grime, dust, and tarnish, returning the surface to its original luster. Satisfaction guaranteed or your money back. Club. Okay. Oh, coal. Coal of warmth. Well, that's something you don't see every day. Not anymore. House that I grew up in, uh, yeah, had a coal chute. So we took out the coal room, and my father built me a bedroom in its place. A coffin? Okay. Coin. Penny of luck? Okay. <laughs> Let's read the penny of luck. This magical copper piece is engraved with a horse's head on one side and a horse's tail on the other. The user may flip the coin at any time, but it has a magical effect only once per day. If it lands heads up, the user gains a minus four bonus to armor class for one turn, but if it lands tails up, the user suffers a plus four penalty to armor class for one turn, so beware the horse's ass. Returning penny. Of course. See? There's a of course there's there's like a bad penny. Always comes back. We have to make a magic item if it's a bad joke or a piece of cliche. Oh, and look. The returning penny may be the source of a well known cliche. See, that's that's one way of trying to get around the fact you're doing something cheesy is to call it out as part of your description. You still, we're still going to call it cheesy. When cast away from the bear, this base piece will teleport to the user's hand from as far as 30 feet away and will avoid all obstacles on its return flight. Okay. Collar. Collar of charisma. Strangling collar. Obvious. Wolf collar. Okay, I'm going to skip that. Cones. Contracts. Control doll. This is like voodoo. Control dolls are made to fit general categories. A man or a woman, a troll, a dragon. To work, an organic sample of the specific target, nail clippings, locks of hair, bits of outer skin, scales, etc., must be made part of the doll. This does sound very kind of voodoo-like. Once the organic material is added, the doll acquires a focus. The doll now must be shown to the intended victim. Okay, that's different. If the victim fails to save versus spell, the victim is charmed like a charm person spell, and this charm lasts for as long as the doll is intact and in the charmer's possession. If the controller loses the doll, or if the doll is destroyed or damaged, the charm is broken. Okay. Cords. Cowls, cots, crowns. Yes, just in case you didn't know what a crown looks like. It's helpful. Let's have crowns. Crucible of melting. Yeah, I worked uh, in a gold refinery. We had a crucible of melting. We poured gold bars with it. Uh, this is a small bowl usually made of fired clay or porcelain used for heating substances to extreme temperatures. The bowl is usually placed on a furnace, but this crucible of melting requires no furnace. It melts any metals within it when the command word is spoken. It takes one turn to bring the crucible to sufficient temperatures to melt metals placed inside. But it has no effect on substances other than metals. So, no, you can't put your soup in there. That will not work. 
whenever a crucible is uh, melting is used, there's a 5% chance of a mishap resulting in an explosion that inflicts 3d10 points of damage to all creatures within 10 feet. A save versus rod staff or wand is allowed. The crucible is allowed an item saving throw versus disintegration. If it fails, it's destroyed. Otherwise, it's unharmed and may be used again. Half of these crucibles remain hot for three turns, while the rest remain hot until a command word is spoken that cancels the heat. Okay, so I guess you'll figure out which one you bought or got. Um, yeah, as you use it. Crutch of lightning. Okay, crystals. Crystal ball. Crystal parrot. Cube. <laughs> cube of bullion. Oh my god. This cube, when touched to any small lead item uh, up to 100 pounds weight, transmute the lead into gold. Oh, okay. So it literally is gold bullion, not, not something you make soup out of. Okay. All right. You got me. You got me there. I was totally ready to like, this like, you know, the complete encyclopedia of dad joke items. There's just too many bad ones here. I'm not complaining. I find it kind of funny. Curtains. Cushions. And daggers. Many daggers. I do love a thrown dagger. It never occurred to me when I played a magic user uh, 30 years ago that that's something that I should have been doing. I leaned a bit too heavily on the spells, but I should have been, I should have been a cool magic user. If I ever play that character again, I will. Spider Fang. Tooth of Torm. Well, and give it a cool name. You know, it's more than just swords. Any, any weapon can benefit from having a cool name. Thinking of uh, Fritz Leiber. Foffer and the Grey Master. Master's weapons were, he, he was a two-handed fighter. One was Scalpel and Cat's Claw. Yeah. Great series. I've said it before. Read it. Dart of Death. Hmm. And Dart of Death Part 2. Dex of Illusions. Many things. Oh, gosh. I was in a game recently. Well, yeah, fairly recently where a deck of many things was found and I was under immense pressure from other players in the game to just draw a card, draw a card, draw a card. Went on for weeks. My character was a very risk-averse thief who would have, despite seeing some of the beneficial things that was happening to other players, also saw the horrible things that happened to those same players and had no interest. And even after they stopped trying to convince my character, you know, in earnest to draw a card, draw a card, draw a card, they continue to joke about it for much longer after. Tarot deck of many things. Wow, and it's even, uh, it's legit. They've done descriptions, and they've broken it up into the four parts. So here's the major arcana. Minor arcana. Cups and swords should be. Cups and swords. Desk of re of restudying? This desk appears to be identical to a desk of studying, which is the next item in the list here. However, any mage who attempts to use this desk to study for one hour forgets all the spells memorized. Okay, that's just cruel. Discus of Disenchantment. Disintegration Chamber. Okay. These frightful devices, devices range in size from one inch square box, okay, to a room ten foot square. Oh my gosh. So you could put that inside of a dungeon or any structure that your players go through. Not giving you any ideas. I certainly wouldn't do anything evil like that. They're always made of iron, and the interior walls may be covered with mirrored tiles. They are used to cause matter to vanish. The amount of material to be affected is limited only by the size of the chamber. So yes, if you can fit your adventuring party, or a couple of members, into one of these maximum 10-foot square rooms, fun cannons ensue. Discs. Tensors, Tantalus. Uh, doors. Drawer of easy retrieval. I need one of those for my house. The junk drawer. When I take that weird bit of plastic that I found that I'm not sure what it is, but it looks like it's really important, but I don't know what it is, but I know eventually I'll figure out what it is, and then I'll need to go looking for it. Put that in your drawer of easy retrieval. 
And that's it. That is it. Okay, I um, don't anticipate there'll be demand to uh, go over volumes 2, 3, and 4, but uh, I'm sure you'll let me know. Thank you for listening.